Hi, my name is Sidney Decker. I work as a professor at Griffith University where I run the Safety Science Innovation Lab and this is module three of our short course on just culture. In this module we'll talk about restorative just culture. You might recall that in the previous module, module two, we talked about retribution and that as a model for just culture and some of the difficulties that creates and some of the protections that may be necessary to make it work at all. Um, in, the, in module one we talked about an introduction and some definitions and some of the issues associated with reporting. After this, module three, we'll go to module four, which talks about second victims, those practitioners involved in an incident for which they feel personally uh, responsible. Um, but now restorative just culture. What is a restorative just culture? Well, here's what we do. We'll talk about some definitions, look at an example, and then revisit the issue of forward-looking accountability as fundamental to restorative just culture. Um, Restorative just culture, says Braithwaite, is a process where all have an opportunity dis to discuss how they have been affected by an injustice and to decide collaboratively, jointly, what they need to do to repair the harm. Where retributive justice is very much focused on the offender, right? It's focused on the offender and their relationship to whoever judges him or her. It may just be involving the supervisor and the offender, and that's it, the offender, all right? Whereas restorative just culture involves many more people, a larger community, right? Which tends to have a much broader base then for any consequences or any decisions that get taken, rather than being hidden away in the supervisor's office and nobody knows, or only based on rumors, why Joe was fired or didn't, didn't show up for work the next day. Restorative just culture puts it out in the open and involves the community, the colleagues, the second victims, the first victims, the managers, other stakeholders, all right? Um, these are the three questions that a restorative process asks. Who's hurt? What are their needs? And whose obligation is it to meet those needs? Now, those are very different questions from the questions asked in retribution. In retribution, remember, the questions were what rule is broken, how bad is the breach, and what should the consequences be? Again, very offender focused. This is involving the community because lots of people may be hurt. Let me illustrate how that works spontaneously in an organization. Here's an, a maintenance organization that, um, uh, in which an employee made an error, and we can talk long and short about that, but made an error that had consequences. The error had bite. That is, um, it cost the airline a lot of money, and also some, some face reputation, but it also had safety consequences. It created safety risk. The air, airline uh, dispatched the airplane um, with, with a faulty part in it. Now, um, so the it turned back, all kinds of delays, and, and, and so pretty bad consequences. Uh, at the end of the day, nobody got physically hurt. However, how do you respond? Well, the retribution uh, way of thinking about just culture would say, well, what rule was broken? Well, what, what about the sign off? Was it just chicken flick? Did he, you know, pencil whip this thing, right? Didn't check the work. Uh, um, and so how bad was that breach? Well, has he done it again, right? Or how bad could the consequences be of this? Well, depending on that, we find out what the proportional response and fair response or retribution should be. And in this case, in many cases, this em employee would probably face severe sanctions. Now, that wasn't done. In this case, the employee volunteered to go on video and explain the whole event. And so what happened was he, he, he stood on the ramp and explained the situation that led up to the error, the shift, how it looked, who was there, um, the consequences of the error. And he also expressed feelings of responsibility and remorse for those consequences as well as the causes. Um, and the video contained also, caution to colleagues, lest the same thing might happen to them, which would be quite likely given the setup of the system. All of this was put on a seven minute video, which was then used throughout the organization in order to learn from this event and all improve. Now, that could be seen as a spontaneous instance of restorative justice. Why? Well, let's look at it. In terms of the employee, what happened? Well, the employee offered honest disclosure. Look, this is I, I've worked for this organization for the last 32 years, and this was the evening, and this is how I got involved in this, right? He gave his account. Remember that in retributive justice, an account is something that you pay or you settle. In restorative justice, it's much more something you tell. 
But by telling it, by sharing that account, by, by sharing the lesson, you could argue that the employee in fact repaid a debt that arose because of the incident. He repaid the debt to his colleagues, to his organization, and some of the trust that had been broken by sharing the story, by expressing remorse and responsibility for the event and its consequences. You could also argue that this employee engaged in forward-looking accountability. Yes, he looked back on the event, but he also looked forward and said, hey guys, if you're involved in something like this in the future, make sure that you check this, do that, do that, don't get involved in the way that I did because da da da. And so forward-looking accountability, all right? This could be seen as restorative action. But what about the company? What about the organization? What's its position in this? Well, did it let the employee off the hook? Because that often is an argument that people come with and say, oh, just this, this type of justice lets people off the hook. I don't think this guy was let off the hook. He had to go on video. He was, he was not necessarily comfortable talking on video, hadn't been taught how to do it, but he did it. And he, he, he made himself vulnerable for all of his colleagues. And there was a whole bunch of colleagues who were going to look at this, right? Um, and so they didn't let him off the hook at all. He was held accountable by giving his account. Um, the organization also understands that this employee is the best expert to learn from. You could go to a consultant and say, how do we avoid this? Yeah, that's nice, cost money, and it may not teach you as much as this employee could teach you because he's been there. He's lived the experience. Who else is better to learn from and to teach the others lest it happens to, him, to them? Um, the organization understands that Sanctioning this employee would exit the story right, out of the organization or would at least silence the story if the man stays. But it also would discourage others from similarly sharing their story. And so, again, that restorative process helped the organization as well. Um, the organization rebuilt trust not by coming down hard on someone and saying, boom, this is the consequence, right? Um, no, it rebuilt trust by being honest to each other, right? As in, hey, we're really upset, this is not good, you know, we're disappointed, we really hope to see better performance from our guys, but help us understand how it happened and help us get the confidence that it won't happen again in the same way. And so um, it rebuilds trust in a very different way. And most importantly, this process helped the organization identify the systemic conditions that gave rise to the error in the first place. And that's a very important distinction between retribution versus re restoration when it comes to your just culture. Remember that a just culture is very much about learning and about that trust, all right? If you want to learn, then punishing people really makes it very difficult to try to get to the systemic story underneath the performance, right? Whereas here, you get that second story. He tells it, that deeper story about all the factors and goal conflicts and constraints. And on top of that, he says, despite all of that, of course I should have known better, done better, absolutely. We all should, all right? But to get an understanding of the conditions that conspire against good performance is one way of creating restorative justice. Now, this works even, not only when something bad has already happened, but with a near miss, with an indication that something bad may happen. Think about these three questions in that case, right? In a near miss, nothing bad has happened yet. But this is the conversation that I'd like to have in that case. Whoa, if this happens, who else could get hurt, right? What do we need to do now so that that doesn't happen, right? And whose obligation is it to do that? That literally is the creation of forward-looking accountability through a restorative process, right? Who else could be hurt by this? What do we need to do now? And whose obligation is it to do that? See if you can get yourself to engage in that sort of forward-looking accountability in your own organization. If we wrap this up, you could argue that retribution is a way of meeting hurt with more hurt. Restoration is a way of meeting hurt with healing. Where do you want to be in your organization? What vision and image of humanity and of your fellow human beings as colleagues do you have and do you share? What are your values in this? Do you want to meet hurt with hurt? Is that who you are? Or do you want to meet hurt with healing? Is that who you are? In the next module, we'll look at second victims and the organizational response to them. In the meantime, again, have a look at citydecker.com slash books to learn more about this stuff or courses so that you can join and learn even more about this face-to-face. -face. Thank you very much.